Okay, so we're going to study with AI. Um, what does that mean? Well, if you watch into a historian's recent video about, hey, I want to learn something, um, but I don't get it, dumb it down. This is what I'm going to do. <laughs> so let's see if this is effective. I'm just curious, okay? So anyways, uh, here's an example. <clears throat> but, uh, <clears throat> All right, so, okay, I'm going to pull up this AI. So why is this statement false? When you access an identifier inside a nested function, Python searches the nested function's local namespace first, then the global namespace, then the built-in namespace, and finally the enclosing function's namespace. This is sometimes referred to as an LGBE, local global built-in enclosing rule. Order max the LGB because we can correct. Wait. Wait, does that wait? The statement is false because Python does not follow the order. Local global built in closing LGBE. Instead, Python used the wait what? The statement is false because Python does not follow the order. Local global built in closing. By who exactly? Okay, I'm not um what do you mean by that why is okay so why wait so why does python not follow the order lgbe instead python uses the legb rule what i meant by that is which other coding languages uses that syntax specifically explain please what the fuck why is that so specific that's gonna be annoying What? That's what. This structure is common in languages that support nested functions and closure. Languages like JavaScript and Ruby also. By the way, what's happening here is I'm trying. I'm recording my. I'm not recording my phone. I'm recording my browser. So I have to keep refreshing this. Which is very inefficient, but. That's all I can do right now. Um, there it is. So Python, fo uh, Python follows the LEGB local enclosing global built-in rule instead of LGBE because it prioritizes nested enclosing scopes over global ones, allowing functions defined within uh, other functions to access variables from their enclosing scope. This structure is common in language that support nested function enclosing. So languages like JavaScript and Ruby also use similar scoping rules, prioritizing local and closing pair. This helps ensure more precise control of variables, accessing, uh, reducing potential conflicts. That's gonna be, I mean, I guess that's an advantage. I don't know. Also, I don't hear any music right now. Is it too quiet? Yeah, it's very quiet. By the way, I'm not sure if you can hear music on my end, but yeah. Okay, now that's very, that's got to be annoying because I'm not going to remember that. <laughs> like, it's like, oh, we're going to do the tests and stuff. Also, why am I squinted all the time? But we're going to do the tests. You're going to need to remember this specific shit. And I'm like, I'm not going to remember that. So I need, so, okay, so what, oh, so I guess I have to say, so Python follows leg B, leg B. <laughs> so if I start reading LGB and I'm like wait a minute that doesn't sound right it's supposed to be leg B and then I'm gonna know that's false I, I don't know if I like that but I mean hey you know all the all coding languages um, even though they technically if you've done enough coding language over the course of your life you will kind of start getting syntaxes like you know like the way how code is structure the structure is different 
but they try to tackle the same thing. That's what the syntax is, you know. But yeah. Anyways, I guess, oh, wait, let me just scroll back up actually, because I skipped a bunch of stuff because I wanted to show an example of how I'm using AI to learn um, as a you know as an introduction for you guys. But anyways, now let me just start reading here. I already did that. This one I really like, by the way. So, um, the reason why statement just as houses are built from blueprints, classes are built from objects. One of the core technologies of object-oriented programming is false. Is because it's the other way around. Um, houses are objects, and classes are blueprints. Think about it that way. And the AI was able to dumb that down for me. If I, if I scroll up here, you might see it here. Let me see. Um. Da -da -da. Here it is. So the statement is false because it's the other way around. See, that's where I got it, and I remember that. So that's a nice, you know, that's a nice way to hopefully learn things. Um, let me see. Let me continue. Okay, so properties look like blank. I did that. The vast variety. I did that. So I hate uh, math. So uh, most likely, maybe I'll try and tackle it, but I don't know. Given a Fahrenheit temperature, we can calculate corresponding blah blah blah. I'm already tuning that out. Let me move on. In this formula, F the Fahrenheit temperature is the blank variable. And C is the Celsius temperature is the... That's just right there. I mean, I was sorry, so I can't even pretend that... I... Okay, so... Let's see. So, given the Fahrenheit temperature, we can calculate the Celsius. So, independent dependent. I guess that makes sense. I don't know. Uh, which of the following statement is false? All of it is true, by the way, so I'll just read them. Each module's global namespace also as an identifier called underscore name underscore containing the module name, such as math for the math module. Okay, that's true. That's true. Python's creates Python creates a module global namespace and loads the module. No global module's global namespace exists in this identifier as in scope to the code within the module until the program or interactive um, session terminates okay each module has its global name wait each module has global namespace associates a module with global identifier such as global variables function names and class names with objects and i um an i python session has its own global namespace wait so let me each global namespace, yeah, cool, okay, that, that makes sense. Time to create some module names. Alright. Can you explain this to me? Um, Python creates a module's global namespace when it loads the module. Uh, module's global namespace exists and its identifiers are in scope to the code within the module until the program or interactive session terminates. Can you explain that to me in simple terms? I'm gonna have a coffee. Let me refresh when this. Loads a module, which is a file of Python code, it creates a global namespace specific to that module. This means that any variables, functions, or classes defined in that module are stored in that namespace and are accessible while the program or session is running. The identifiers, like variables or functions, in that namespace remain available as long as the module is in use. But once the program or session ends, that namespace is discarded. Essentially, the module's content stay accessible only while the program runs. Okay, so I kind of I kind of get it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna try and do that thing that Instarian did. I don't get it. Can you dumb it down? I'll lower the audio. I'm not sure how loud okay. it is. Alright, so okay, here's a simpler version of what I When you run a program with a module, a uh, Python file, uh, Python makes a box for that module. I do remember. I actually do remember the professor um, drawing that in the class session we did. So, okay, this is familiar territory. 
Um, okay, so box for the modules, variables, and functions. Everything in that box is available while the program is running. Once the program stops or you close the session, the box and everything inside it disappears, which makes sense. This box is called the modules global namespace. Wait, this box is called the modules global basically everything inside. Oh, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna do it again. I don't get this part. Um so everything oh wait, oh no wait, I I don't get this part. Um this box is called the modules global namespace. What does that mean? Can you dumb it down for me, please? Okay, get another uh, coffee. I need a coffee. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's not what I was talking about. In Python, this store is called the module store. It's, it's just where Python stores. Python stores oh, so this is why I want. Does that help? No, so I get the first part, but what I'm asking is this why is it called the modules global ma namespace? Okay, um, is, that, is the whole thing necessary or. Is it just parts of it? It's like, is, is it just global namespace or module? I don't get it. Can you dumb that down? Or can you explain to me why it's called that way? <laughs> I'm, yeah, we'll see. Ah, I see what you're asking. Let's break it down. In Python, global namespace refers to a space where variables and functions are stored that are available throughout the whole module. The term module just means a specific file or script you're working on in Python. So when it's called modules global namespace, it means it's the space where all the variables and functions specific to that module file are stored and accessible as long as the program is running. Does that make more sense now? I can't really keep uh, waiting for it to refresh. Oh, there it is. Okay, so in Python, global namespace, okay, so that's what it was, referring to a space where variables and functions are stored that are available throughout the whole module. The term module, okay, blah, blah, blah. Um, so when it's called modules global namespace, it means it's a space where all the variables and functions specific to that module file are stored and accessed as long as the problem is running. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess, yeah. Okay, so I guess, yeah, um, not sure if that will help me, but I did remember, I immediately started remembering uh, the class uh, with the box thing. That I do, so I'm not sure if that's helping, but I'm going to screw this. Let's move on. Okay, so... Okay, so we can take advantage of this subclass object. It's a base class object. We're going to to place objects related to inheritance into a list, then iterate through the list, and treat each element as a base class object. Uh, with inheritance, every object of a subclass also may be treated as an object of that subclass base class. By the way, all of this is true statements. Oh god, okay, the following code places commission salary blah blah blah, 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 blah. okay i'm just gonna copy and paste this <laughs> i'm not gonna i'm just gonna copy this and i'm just gonna here all right so uh let me see so uh ex explain why this statement is true and then there you go Let's uh, fucking. <laughs> By the way, so there's not gonna be any audio because I'm using the web browser, so I'm just gonna have to read this shit. The statement is true because it demonstrates polymorphism in Python. I don't know whether <laughs> polymorphism allows object of different classes, in this case, commission employee and salary commission employee, to be treated as instance of a common base class employee. I think I remember. I think I remember that kinda what my eyes is by the way my eyes not supposed to be closed but for some reason I guess I'm squinting too much I don't know maybe if I okay I only have one eye closed whatever I don't care also it's blinding me I'm gonna turn this off now <clears throat> alright so both objects can be placed in a list employees and loop through calling the same method which there you go there it is see earnings cuz Okay, so from what I understand, polymorphism is the term used when, when you, 
when you let's you know so here's a function right let's say there's a function or whatever class usually in coding you can just leave if the function itself is designed in the way where you can just leave it blank and it's gonna work I assume that's what polymorphism means this means that depending on how the function again I could be using a different terminology because you know I I've tackled multiple coding languages so I'm kind of losing track of how each is called <laughs> um, but if you're wondering what I'm using this term on I'm, I'm referring to it in GML if you're wondering but anyways so this function can serve multiple you know things like you know which is polymorphism it, this function could either mean you know empty but then it's going to be like this function and then maybe you could have an argument one argument one right so you can actually put something in it and it's gonna change how it behaves but then the last one would be argument one or an argument two if you put two arguments you will know that it's functioning differently so that's what i think polymorphism means i could be saying it to the ai now actually okay so if i understand what you're saying just bear in mind that i'm not sure if i'm going to say it right because i've tackled multiple david coding languages and there's a chance that I'm going to start mixing them up or forgetting things. So I'll just explain what I think you just told me and tell and let me know if I did it right. So I so what when you when you say polymorphism, I assume you meant something like this. So let's pretend that there's a thing called function and then you it's a close, right? And if you leave it blank, it'll just function as it is if it's designed that way. On the other hand, if a function allows like an argument inside it, then it'll function differently. And um, and then another one would be a function may might even contain uh, more arguments, like maybe up to two, and then it'll also function differently as well. So I guess an example would be function and then first name and then last name, and then it'll it'll then generate you know the you know, using the two arguments, which is first name and last name. On the other hand, if you leave it blank then you're treating it as a checker, like a way to check things, I assume. So is that correct? Is that what polymorphism means? Let's see if I did it right. I could be wrong. I'm gonna refresh. You're on the right track with your explanation. Polymorphism is about how a single function or method can work differently depending on the object or arguments passed to it. For example... Okay, so I guess I'm right. <laughs> I think I am right. <laughs> I need I need a model where I'm drinking coffee. That would just make it so nice. But I need a better computer first. I need to save money. Taking different arguments like first name and last name and behaving differently is a good way to think of it. Okay, so I guess I'm I'm absolutely right. It didn't like say no. You're on the right track. I mean, obviously it says right track, so obviously, um, I may have said it a, a bit vague, but just right there. So, Pomeranz is about how a single function or method. See. It even comes in different words, functions and methods. It's already different. Maybe they were referring to it in terms of class or all I know, but you know. Um can work differently. There's a fire truck passing by. Um depending on the object or arguments passed to it, for example, if you have a function that can handle different types of inputs like a number or a string or even an object, polymerism allows that function to behave appropriately based on what it receives. Your example of a function taking different arguments like first name and last name and behaving differently is a good way to think about it. yeah so yeah absolutely right so yeah so that's why this is considered a true statement also i don't hear any music right now because this is too quiet i'm just gonna move to the next one okay that's also quiet whatever okay seems five was <laughs> seems five doesn't exist yeah okay so uh, I already did this just now. This is the this is the leg B. See, I, I remember this is the leg B part. Which of the right statements is false? Okay, so so why is this statement false? Operator overloading works only with objects of costume classes. I am aware of operator overloading, by the way, but does it only work? It's false, it says. Operator overloading works only with objects of custom class. 
is false because operator overloading can also work with built-in types in Python. For example, Python already overloads operators for types like integers, floats, and strings, e.g. using plus to add numbers or concatenate strings. Okay. However, custom classes allow you to define how operators work for your own object. But the concept isn't limited solely to custom classes. Alright, so, I mean, I mean, yeah, okay, so, you kind of get the point. Um... I'm just gonna read through the entire thing so I can get the I can absorb. So, oper operator overloading works only with objects of costume classes is false because operator overload can work with built-in types in. Wait, yeah, no, no, no shit. Yeah, by the way, it's like okay, I'm getting now. I'm getting. I get what I mean. By the way, because you know, um, that I thought that was the whole point of operator overloading, right? Is you can change how a plus behaves, which is weird as fuck. But for example, Python already overloads operators for types like integers, floats, and strings, e.g., using plus to add numbers or cause uh, concatenate concatenate strings. Concatenate strings. However, custom class allows you to define how operators work on your own objects, but the concept isn't limited solely to costume classes. Okay, so. Yeah, so that one I, I already knew, but being able to have the AI tell me that, and yeah, I, I kind of get what you mean by custom classes then. Um, cause that, is that the whole point of operator overloading, uh, which is like you know, changing how uh, a, you know, a plus works, and, or add, whatever you call it. So, so uh, all the statements are true by the way. So, the overloaded plus operator is used for adding numeric values. Con con Concatenating list, concatenating strings, and adding a value of every element in a numpy array. Use operator overloading to define how Python's operator should handle objects on your own costume types. Okay, that's great. The overloaded um, enclosure operator is used for accessing elements in list tuples of or tops or tops tuples um strings and arrays and for accessing the value for a specific key and dictionary the overloaded um multiplication or asterisk or whatever the fuck that's called operator is used for multiplying numeric um values repeating the sequence and multiplying elevate in, in a numpy array for a specific value yeah so i mean yeah i get yeah so which of the following statement is false okay why is this statement false when creating a new class Instead of writing all new code, you can designate that the new class is to be formed initially by inheriting the attributes and methods of a previously defined base class, also called a subclass, and the new class is called a deriv derived class or a superclass. Okay. The statement is false because of a mix-up in terminology. When you create a new class that inherits from another, the class you're creating is called a subclass or derived class, and the class you're inheriting from is called the base class or superclass. The statement incorrectly I'm noticing a lot of by calling the new class a superclass, which is actually the name for the class being inherited. I'm okay, so I'm noticing a pattern here. <laughs> um, the pattern is I noticed a pattern that most of these things. Are you should I just swapped? Is it just me or is that what? I, wait, let me just read this properly, just to know, just to confirm my suspicion. The statement is false because of a mix-up in terminology. When you create a new class that inherits from another, so you know, when you create a new class that inherits from another, the class you're creating is called a subclass or a derived class. The class you're inheriting from is called oh the class the class you're inheriting from called the base class or superclass. The statement incorrectly swaps these terms by calling the new class a superclass, which is actually the name for the class. Yeah, so I think the way how this book, I noticed that the way how you can tell, the way how this goddamn midterms is gonna look like is they just swap term, uh, the terms, which is fucking, <laughs> now, that I'm reading, now that I'm reading it, the pattern is just that, it's just swapping it. It's not really completely changing the meaning of something. They just swap it to confuse you. So you need to pay attention to that. But yeah, so pretty much, and again, it kind of it kind of makes sense, right? So subclass, you're inheriting it from somewhere, and the base class, um, is sometimes it's also called a superclass, which, which makes sense. I usually call it like a parent class 
you know, different coding language. But, but yeah, so that's what I'm noticing. The ter so I'll look for that. I'll look for that pattern of I'll read it and it feels off. Where in terms of like, if the if the sentence feels like the um they've been swapped, then most likely that's the correct answer. <laughs> Uh, AKA that's the false uh, statement. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. I'm seeing the pattern now. The other classes also offer varied and okay, yeah, wait. Um, okay, so here's another. Wait, I'm gonna read this one first before I move on. These are two um statements, by the way. New classes can be formed quickly through inheritance and composition from classes in abundant class libraries. Eventually, software will be constructed predominantly from standardized reusable components. Just as hardware is constructed from interchangeable parts today, this will help meet the challenges of building ever more powerful software. Okay, that's kind of cool. That um, eventually it will construct it primarily from standardized reusable components, just as hardware. Well. Yeah, so future perfect pretty much. After inheriting, you can customize the, the derived class to meet the specific needs of your application. To minimize the customization effort, you should always try to inherit from the base class that's closest to your needs. Which I did experience that recently. I was working on one of my game projects, and the foundation was so shit. <laughs> the foundation was so shit that just trying to use that, you know, trying to pretty much inherit that um, script, and then not working as intended pissed me the fuck off because it wasted so much fucking time. So I ended up having to completely like pull it out from its roots and do it again. And then hopefully it's future proof. But I don't know. <laughs> I won't know until I you know, I end up in a dead end and then I'll realize god fucking damn it, the the base fucking code uh, the foundation of it was shit. Now I'm gonna have to redo it and hope to god when I try to re, you know, re, recreate it. Hopefully it won't break the existing code that inherited from it, you know? Anyways. Okay, so this part is a false one. So let's re, let me let the AI know. Uh, data class, oh, so wait, wait, before, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, so tell me, can you explain to me why this statement is false? A data class cannot auto-generate the special methods that overload the greater or greater than equal and then less than or less than equal comparison operators. I'm not sure if I said it right, but we'll see. The statement is false because data classes can auto generate comparison operators like greater than and less than under if you add the add data class order equals true decorator. Okay. This tells Python to generate methods like L E G yeah. and G Let me read this properly. The same is false because data classes can auto generate comparison operators like greater than and less than if you add the add data class order true. Hmm. I don't get I don't get it. Can you dumb it down? <laughs> What the fuck is this music? I knew it, it's Fallout. <laughs> it's not a... I'm gonna change it. Seems for... Lo-fi, I guess? Wait, maybe not lo-fi. Oh, here it is. I like this part. I'm gonna assume this is gonna be an ad. Okay, no ad. I'm surprised. This is classic Sims. Sims? Did I just call it the Sims Sims? Oh god. Anyways, let me read this shit. A data class can automatically generate comparison operators like, you know, less than, greater than, blah 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 blah. Uh, I just realized, greater than and less than, I meant, I flipped it. But anyways, if you tell it to, when you create a data class and use add data class order true, Python will automatically generate those methods for you. It means the class can now compare two objects and... No wait, we have this extra... I don't get it. Um, what I'm asking for is this: when you create a data class and use add data class order 
equals true. What does that mean? Like, how do I know this? What does that specific thing mean? <laughs> I'm actually enjoying this shit. When you create a data class in Python, Fresh. that data class will be true. It means that Python will automatically generate... I ran out of coffee. The object can be ordered or ranked using these comparison. I mean, yeah. The data will be ranked. You created their class in Python use at. <laughs> I don't get it. Dump it down. Okay, what I'm asking for is how will I remember this when I'm coding? Obviously, when I'm coding. Uh, most likely, you know, like whatever software I'm using is gonna suggest something is most likely it's gonna be one of them But how will I remember that? Dumb it down, please uh, Music too loud Oh water I might go out after this actually Okay, it should show up here now. Okay, maybe I have to refresh. Oh, there it is. To remember at data class, order equals true. Think of it like it, this. It's telling Python to ultimately give you, give your class the ability to compare its objects like bigger, small, equal, if you're sorting or ranking objects. You'd want this, so when coding, if you ever think, I need to compare this objects or sort them then when you use order equals true it makes your class comparison ready just associate order with comparing your sorting <laughs> i'm sorry I could... listen i i need i need this <laughs> i don't get it dumb it down what, what i'm asking for is this um I, I, i'm kind of getting it but now it's like this can you give me a scenario when i need something can you give me an example please dumb it down please i don't get it <laughs> I'm gonna refresh this shit. Sure. Let me give you a simple example. Imagine you have a class for fruit with attributes like size and sweetness. Now, you okay, want to sort fruits based on how sweet or big they are without using data class order is true. You know, I should just listen to her first. To compare each fruit size or sweetness. But when you use order is true, Python does that comparison for you. So, if you have a list of fruits and want to sort them by sweetness or size, all right, so now I'm gonna read this part. Imagine you have a class for fruit with attributes like size and sweetness. Now you want to sort different fruits based on how sweet or big they are. Without using it, you'd have to manually write code to compare each fruit size or sweetness. Most likely, I'll do that because <laughs> I'll most likely, most likely I'll forget about that class shit. Um, but when you use order true, Python does that comparison for you. So if you have a list of fruits and want to sort them by sweetness size, make it easier compare short and modify. I don't get it. No, no, I mean I kind of get it. But how about this? Can you make me a code? for me to see this. I want you to take this example you just said and I want you to show it in code form so I will be able to see it as it is. Okay, let's let's give it a try. I'm gonna refresh this yet. Oh it's it's thinking, it's thinking. I was trying to run the code to show you the results, but I'll walk you through it instead. Okay. Here's how the example works in Python code form. I just realized Python that it, it, I think it, let me see. Oh, here it is. There you go. There it is. Uh-huh, sorry. The sorted function 
options for the fruit yeah. based on their sweetness, first and size, second. By using order truth, you can easily sort objects like this without having to write a lot of comparison methods. Yeah, instead of ifs. Get it? This would be a lot of ifs and else yonder and <laughs> Alright, all right, so here, here's the explanation. Okay, so data class with order. The data class order decorated means Python will automate blah blah blah. Okay, class fruit. The class has two attributes size and blah. Okay, we then Python will compare the sweetness of the fruits and then size to the then. Apple object da 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 da. Apple blah blah blah. Yeah, sorting. There's a sorting function. Yep, uh, based on the sweetness. Okay, so let's look at the actual code. Okay, analysis error. He noticed an error for some reason. Oh, yeah, okay, so this he was writing it down and they made an error somewhere. But anyways, I was trying to write a code to show you the results, but while walking through it instead. Here's okay. So here's the actual code, what it would look like in our life. So here it is. Interesting. That's weird. I have to specifically write this <laughs> in order for this shit to work. I'm not going to remember that <laughs> at the moment because... Um, number one, uh, Python is not my main coding language. I'm currently using GML right now, so I'm not gonna remember this. Um, but, you know, um, hopefully if more and more of it shows up in other coding languages, I will pretty much get the, the syntax of it. Anyways, so you need to write this, add your close, order, true. So, class, fruit, size, sweetness. So, create some fruit objects. So, apple equals size, sweetness, Okay, and then fruit size sweetness, let's sort by sweetness, then size of sweetness is equals. So, sort, fruit, sorted. So, this specific thing, this specific function, which obviously has this array or list, I guess. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. They all use different terms. Um, but yeah, so this list or this array will obviously hold this. Um, variables correct and each variable will contain this shit which by the way th this class will contain this specific integers so you'll con so this class fruit will contain size integer and sweetness integer and you're creating wait it's not a variable it's a object instance i forgot let's just use that terms because it's right there <laughs> so we're gonna create an object using the blueprint fruit. So here's the blueprint. It will then say, okay, so the size of this, which is, you know, sometimes you don't actually need to mention this part. Usually it'll just show up in some of your software, specifically. I'm not gonna, oh, here, here, I'm, I'm sure. So, yeah, PyCharm community. Yeah, so PyCharm usually will mention it to you. So that's cool. So it'll look like that. You just need to type in the, you know, you'll pull this out and it'll say this, uh, you'll say this words like in a dark gray font. Um, and it'll let you know what to put in there pretty much. So it's like a hint. So the first argument is the size and the second argument is a sweetness in this blueprint, which this apple will then become an object. And inside this list, I guess that's why it's called a list and not an array. I don't fucking know. Um, inside this fruit list, it will contain three objects: but apple, banana, orange. And using this, making sure that this data class is activated, which is order true. Sort by sweetness, then the size, and then it'll automatically sort these things by fruit. So when you run it, it will. I mean, I could technically. I mean, I, I don't have to do this because I have to save it and I don't want to just know that this will work. <laughs> Hopefully, um, ChatGPT will implement like a run button here somewhere, but maybe that would break them. So maybe they don't have to do it. I can just go online and just, I don't want to do it right now because, you know, that's not my point. You know, fuck it. I'll just do it. I'll fucking do it. Fuck it. Uh, I'm gonna, how do I open this safely? Uh, oh yeah, Sims. I'll use Sims. <laughs> I use the Sims. All right, so I'm gonna open Sims. I'm gonna do Python um, code running. I don't, I don't know what to call it. Online Python. Let's see if this will work. Okay, this might work. Maybe I don't know. So I'm just gonna copy his code and I'm just gonna paste it. But also, it's too bright. Let me. There you go. Dim it down. If I run it, it should. Oh, okay, so. 
process exited return code zero I just realized that there is no print so I can't even see it um, I guess I can type it in but I really am lazy print uh, I'm already forgetting <laughs> I'm, too, I'm too lazy <laughs> I'm too lazy. <laughs> let me do this. Okay, let me do this. Um, all right. Can you take this code and um add a print? <laughs> add a print um code to it so I can copy paste it into a website that can run it so I can see the sorting order I don't know how to spell <laughs> but I don't care <laughs> hey hey this is a good example of the use of AI for teaching purposes alright here's the modified code uh, listen I I deal with multiple coding languages, okay? It, it's getting very easy to forget things. So here it is. Copy this code, just slap it in there, say fuck it and run it. Let's see, sort it. So let's just look at this. I'm not looking at this right now. My eyes are all the way up here. I'm looking at this part first. So so the size of this is five, twin is seven. So four, nine, what does it say? Order true. So I guess, I don't really, I don't really know what the sorting is. I assume it's just automated. I'm gonna assume is. Oh, I'm, I don't need to assume. I'll just see it. So five, seven, four. Okay, so let's just see what it looks like. Fuck it. Some fruit size four sweetness. Okay, it did do. So this is a good example of sometimes it's a little dumb. It's supposed to show me apple banana or orange but it didn't do that but whatever I can see yeah see um I realized that it didn't take what I'm whatever you know we you get it we get it let's move on I'm trying to get ready for this I gotta get I got I got I got it let's move on alright so so this one is oh so I'm gonna continue from here all of this should be true statements the required variable um and uh, for class attributes what time is it it's about it's almost 12 a.m. by the way so I've been working here for almost an hour which is not a lot actually wow <laughs> the required variable um my back hurts actually let me let me fix myself oh, there I go ooh I'm bending my back I'm gonna need to work um, on that back pose in one of my blender projects later um, I bet you would be fun. Anyways, it makes people horny if they see that pose. Uh, the required variable annotation for class attributes and data attributes enable you to take advantage of st static code analysis tools. So you might be able to eliminate additional errors before they can occur at execution time. A data class auto generates initiate reference. Okay, uh, let's move on to a different discussion. Can you tell me what this term means? A data class auto generates. Actually, no, you don't need to read that. Part. I don't know why I'm. No, this is what I want to do. Um, underscore I N I T underscore. What does that mean? What's the full word of that? Um, underscore R E P R underscore. Again, the same thing. What's the What does that mean? What's the full word of that? And underscore E Q underscore. Okay, I just want to know what they're actually called, so it makes it easy to remember. That's why I'm Let's asking. Break down each of those special methods. One init stands for initialize. Initialize. Name, initialize. This method is the constructor the of a class. It's automatically called when you create an instance of a class. Oh, you initialize isn't. the object's attributes. It's where you define what happens when the class is first created. Example: You can see the code in our conversation history. Two repr okay. stands for representation. Alright, so this means initialize, which I already knew. This one, I kind of knew it was called that. Equal! Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's over here. 
Yeah, you could. The man is used to compare to our dicks. Which is true or false. Okay. Okay. Let me read through this so I can absorb this. So, in it, which means initialized, um, this method is the constructor of a class. Yeah, that makes sense. It's actually it's automatically called when you create an instance of a class to initialize the object's attributes. It's where you define what happens when the class is first created. Um, Repper. Repper. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> Anyways, um, representation. This method returns a string that should ideally be valid Python expression that is used to create. Yeah, it's mainly it's mainly used for strings. It meant for variables to have a formal string representation of the object. Used mainly for debugging. So here's uh here's one of them. So define uh, define representation return car make self make la 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 yeah so. I wonder if I can copy that and then just run it. What it look like? I, I, it's not really showing me anything because it's, a, it's, <laughs> it's not really showing anything because you know it's a, it's it's literally, it's just I'm just sending I'm just you know it's just, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, let's move on. So, some static code analysis tools and IDs. Um, or what's what I call it? In development, I forgot what it's called. Uh, can inspect variable uh, annotations and issue warning if your code goes wrong. Time. This sounds familiar. I think I just read this. Is it the same thing as the one on top? Wait. Some static code analysis tools and IEDs can inspect variable annotations and issue warnings if your code uses the wrong time. This can help you locate logic errors in your code before you execute it. And the one above is. Required variable attendance are called blah 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 starting an ask so you might be able to limit it additional before you can have your it sounds it's, I think it's a little bit the same <laughs> I think I don't know anyways which of the following statements about a class utility methods is false they serve as part of a class interface this is this is considered false can you explain to me why this statement is false they serve as part of a class interface Wait, I think I missed a Reddit wrong. Which of us means about a class? Statement. Oh. They serve as part of a class interface. It's false because utility methods are. Okay, so it knows. It knows. Because I forgot to mention the class utility method part. Let me listen for a second. Oh. Where is it? Where are you? Use my code outside of the class, providing access to its functionality and control way. Utility methods are typically hidden from public interface. Okay, so let me read this now. They so so the class utility method um serve as a class interface is false because class or utility methods are typically meant to be used internally by the class, which you know makes sense. Um, and are not intended to be asked directly by outside code. These methods are often named, I guess that's considered like a local code, right? Or, yeah. These methods are often named with a single leading underscore, yeah, underscore helper, underscore method, to indicate they are for internal use only. Therefore, they are not considered part of the public interface that clients of the class should in to interact with, yeah. A contrast, a class public interface consists of methods that are intended for use by code outside the class, providing access to its functionality in a controlled way. Utility methods are typically hidden from its public interface. So is that, I mean, it's the same thing as private stuff. But the thing is, the private, um, pri using the word private is more of a data thing. Meanwhile, this one, which is utility methods, are specifically designed in a way where if you are collaborating with another programmer, they should never have access to that. Not because they will do anything nefarious, but most likely they will break your code. 
most likely, and then it will ruin the relationship, it's gonna cost me thousands of dollars. But yeah, so let's move on. So this next statement should be true. They are used inside the class, which makes sense. In other object-oriented languages like C++, Java, and C Sharp, or CH, or C whatever the fuck you're called, your two methods typically are implemented as private methods. Yeah, see, there we go. Um, except you know the one I'm using for Python is private data, but whatever. They should be named with a single leading underscore. Okay, so I I get that, but can you explain me this part? So this statement is true. They should be named with a single leading underscore. Why? Why is that important? Can you explain to me the difference between a single leading underscore versus having to use it twice for other parts of Python? Listen, <laughs> if you don't get it, fuck. <laughs> is it too loud? Okay, so it's a it's a formal thing, standardized thing. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is helpful for ensuring that the attribute or method is private to that class, especially if there might be name conflicts in some classes. Yeah, so there it is. It's more about protecting variables, variables from being unrelated to change or reverting by the sub law. Yeah. In short, single leading on the score is convention for internal use, internal a soft way to discourage use. use. Double leading underscore enforces privacy by maggling the name to make it hard to access outside the class. So that's it. That's why we use those fucking things. Let me let me read it so I can fully observe. In Python, a single leading underscore um, underscore method is convention that indicates a method or attribute is intended for eternal use only. It's not a rule enforced by the language itself, but it signals to other programmers um, that this part of the code is not meant to be accessed or modified directly. It's like saying, hey, this is internal. Use it carefully. Uh, even though you can still access it, the single underscore is a way for communicating that it's not part of the public interface. On the other hand, double leading underscore the name mangling. Python changes the name of the method or attribute internally to avoid accidental overwriting or accessing in subclasses. This is helpful for ensuring that the attribute or method is private to that class, especially if there might be a name conflict. It's a lot of complex in, in subclasses. It's more about protecting variables from being inadvertently changed or overridden by subclass. I wish I went to the nearest giant store and bought myself a, lime, a key lime pie. I mean, I didn't know I wanted it until now. <laughs> it's too late now, it's closed. So the closest one would be driving a far away, which would cost me a lot of mileage on my car. I'm gonna need to repair it soon. Oh, I need to serve it soon. It's gonna cost me a lot of money. So again, short. Single leading underscores, don't touch it. And double leading underscore, enforce privacy by mangling the name to make it harder to access outside the class. Okay, yeah, got it, got it, got it. I kinda wanna take a break, but I don't really know what to take a break to. Oh, how about this? I'll go to 30 and maybe I'll take a break? I don't know. So, which of five segments? Okay, so let me. Okay, so assuming the class times um, initialized method or init method receives hours, minutes, and second parameters based on the following code. So, which of five statements is true? So, I'm gonna ignore everything else but this one. Second has a default argument in the init method definition. Why? <laughs> Do I want to ask that question specifically? Assume that class times underscore init underscore method receives hour, minute, and second parameters based on the following code wake underscore up equals time encapsulate hour equals 6 minute on, uh, uh, equals uh, 30 
which of the following statements is true? And the answer should be second has a default argument in the underscore init underscore methods definition. Here's my answer. Here's my question. Why? I need uh, listen. I need to. I need to understand this. The statement is true because in Python, when you define an init method, you can assign default values to parameters, which means the parameter becomes optional when creating an object. In this case, if the init method of the time class is defined like this, oh, yeah. you can see the code in our conversation history. Here, the hour, minute, and second parameters all have default values of zero. So if you provide a value for hour and minute, but not for second, the second parameter automatically yeah, yeah. defaults to zero. In the code wake up equals time hour equals six, minute equals 30, you provide values for hour and minute, but you don't provide a value for second. Since second has a default value of zero, it will be automatically set to zero in this case. That's why the statement is true. Second has a default argument in the init methods definition. That's real. That is true because in Python, when you define an uh, initialized method, you can assign default values to parameters, which means the parameter becomes optional when creating an object in this case. If the initialized method of the time class is defined like this, which is you know, your credit class, and here's the and you're defining it by initializing this self, which is important, by the way, uh, when you're in this constructor, right? Yeah. Um, hours equals to zero. Minute equals to zero and second is equal to zero. Then when you start, you know, referencing itself, okay, when you're starting to, I forgot the term, when you're about to make an object and you're using the class time, this is what's inside of it. This is what the, what this is what the constructor is. Self, which is time. That keep that in mind. All the self replace that with the word time. So this would then be called time dot hour equals to hour. And what what's and what's equals to zero. Okay, so I get it. So let's move on. It's about to be. It's about to hit. Third. I'm gonna take a break after this. I think to create a decimal object, we can write value equals decimal tree. Oh, so that's pi, right? Yeah. So yeah, to create a decimal object, we can write value equals decimal. This is known as a blank expression because it builds and initializes the object of the class. I just explained this, but let me. Um. But I can't seem to process it. Okay, can you explain this to me, please? Um, to create a decimal object, we can write value equals decimal encapsulate uh, 3.14159. This is known as a blank expression because it builds and initializes an object of the class. Can you explain to me why the answer is constructor? I'm getting I'm like I'm getting lightheaded. I'm getting lightheaded. <laughs> the answer is constructor is because when you write value equals decimal three point one four one five nine, you are constructing a new object of the class decimal. Mm -hmm. In object oriented programming, a constructor is a special yeah. type of function that is automatically called to her. when a new object of a class is created. It builds and initializes the object with the necessary attributes. In Python, this is typically done by the whole init method within a class. However, in this case, decimal is a class from Python's decimal module, and it also uses a constructor to create new decimal objects. So when you write decimal 3.14159, you are calling the constructor of the decimal class, which takes the string 3.14159 as input and initializes the object with that value. This process is known as a constructor expression because it builds, constructs, and initializes an object of the class. Okay, show me the text, please. Where is it? I'm gonna refresh it. Oh, there it is. Alright, okay, so. Where is it? Okay. I just realized there's a button there to, you know, make it talk, but whatever. I'm already using it right now, so you know. I wanna see it, I wanna read it, I wanna read it, I must learn. So I can also take a break. I wanna take a break, please. I wanna take a break, please, hurry up. 
Um, wait, how about this? I'm gonna ask it a, I'm gonna ask it a question while it's loading. Okay, so I'm about to hit the 30 mark of this, you know, this tutoring session we're doing right now. So here's what I'm figuring out. I'm about to take a break soon, but then uh, I might go further, or maybe that'll be enough. I don't know. Um, but here's what I want to know. Um, do you think it's a good idea? Do you think it's a good idea for me to like take the midterms right now after this once I'm done with my break, or do you think I should sleep on it and do it tomorrow? Which one would you know most likely percentage wise? Uh, will get me the higher score when I take the class or will take the the exam. It's not showing here for some reason. Oh here, come on, man! It's not showing it. Taking a break is definitely a good idea to recharge, but deciding when to take the exam depends on how you're feeling mentally and physically. If you're still sharp and focused after your break, taking the midterm now might work. However, if you're feeling tired. Oh. So let me just read you know, So the reason the answer is, uh, is constructed is because when you write value decimal, uh, you're constructing a new object of the class decimal. Okay. In object oriented blah, blah, constructor is a special type of function that is automatically called when a new object of a class is created. It builds and initializes the object with the necessary attributes. In Python, this is typically done by the underscore init underscore method within the class. However, in this case, decimal is a class from Python's decimal module. It's also used to construct to create a new decimal object. So when you write decimal blah blah, blah you're, creating you're calling the constructor um, of the decimal class, which is the blueprint, which takes the string, etc., etc., as an input and in the blah, 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 the value. This process is known as a constructor compression because it builds constructs and constructs. Now, okay, so, so here's what I'm um understanding if i take it now after a short break i have an 80 to 85 percent chance of doing well on the other hand if you're feeling fatigued or distracted hang on till tomorrow until i might give you a chance to okay i'm gonna ask one more one last question okay so let's say that i want to get a 90 to 95 percent chance of getting you know a better grade tomorrow because my class is also tomorrow uh, which is also the deadline of the midterms. So if I let's say go to sleep and I wake up, do I immediately take the midterms now uh, then, or what do I do to like maximize my chance? Because you know I won't have much time tomorrow. So do I just wake up and then you know just go online immediately and just take the exam, or do I need to do like a quick review? What do I do exactly to maximize my chance tomorrow if I do take the sleeping route? Because, you know, like, uh, I want to know, like, uh, if 18, uh, you know, because... If you want to maximize your chance of getting a high grade tomorrow, here's a plan that could work well. One, sleep first. Get a full night's rest so your brain is refreshed. This is essential for retention and focus. Two, wake up with enough time. Aim to give yourself at least an hour or two before the midterm. Don't jump straight into the exam the second you wake up. Okay. Three, do a quick review. Spend about 30 minutes reviewing key concepts, especially the ones you had the most trouble with during today's session. Skim over your notes or questions you struggled with. Just to refresh your memory, this will help solidify what you learned. Four, stay calm and focused. Before jumping into the midterm, take a few deep breaths. Don't rush. Being calm will help with focus and prevent careless mistakes. Five, take the midterm. Once you're feeling ready, go for it. You should be well rested and refreshed with your memory and focus at their best. Does this plan sound like it could work with your schedule tomorrow? 
Yeah, I think I like that. I, uh, I think I like that plan. So here's what I wanted to do. Um, based on our session tonight, or just today, I guess. Um, can you generate the key terms of pretty much what we worked on, so that I can pretty much like uh, uh, once I wake up tomorrow, I'm gonna immediately open ChatGPT, and I'm gonna quickly go through the key terms so I can then be ready for the midterm. All right, so while ChatGPT is generating it, polymorphism, the ability to send the same method call to different types of objects, allowing each object to respond. I'm going to quickly go through my base shape. class versus subclass. Base classes are more general, while subclasses become more specific. Constructor for init, a special method that initializes an object's attributes when the object is created. Or string representation, a method that defines how an object is converted to a string. Especially when using print or star. Five, operator overloading. The ability to define how operators like plus or star work for custom class objects. Six, namespace and scope. Different regions in a program where identifiers are recognized. So, uh, Python okay. follows the leg E, local and closing global built in rule for variable lookup. Here it Seven, is. data class. A class that automatically generates special mm -hmm. methods like mm -hmm. unit, wrapper, mm -hmm. and comparison operators. Adding at data class, order equals true, allows comparison of objects using etc. 8. Leading underscore. A single leading underscore, e.g. variable, is a convention to indicate a private variable or method. Two underscores trigger name mangling, e.g. a variable becomes class name variable. 9. Class attributes. Shared across all instances of a class, typically accessed through the class, rather than individual objects. 10. Utility methods. Methods used inside a class, but not meant to be accessed outside of it. These are often named with a leading underscore to indicate they are for internal use. You can review these before the exam tomorrow to refresh your memory. Okay, so I think that's it for this session. Um, I'm gonna pretty much um, look... Oh wait, I can just copy this, right? I'm gonna copy this and I'll just open it like somewhere and then hopefully in other words um, maybe on my phone so when I wake up I'll just quickly look through it <laughs> I'm gonna post it in my discord and they're gonna be so confused it's like what the fuck is that <laughs> I'm just gonna do that fuck it I'll do that so yeah thank you guys for whoever is you know not bored of their heads um, thank you for hanging out with me I guess and yeah maybe this might help you know maybe this would have been useful for you or if not maybe use this as a background sound uh hopefully you enjoy this you know time being productive so yeah good luck to me tomorrow and yeah um